Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A slight delay because of uh, submission we are having, paper submission at ACM. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is Optum, lecture 12, where we are actually plunge into optimization algorithms. Um, so having uh, basically got a glimpse of, you know, how the nature of the surface matters, the nature of the optimization curves matter. Uh, we go to be a little fast paced now. Um, especially as far as the math is concerned, the derivations are concerned, because they can take forever, right? Um, <clears throat> so all the math will be here, but I'll give you the basic intuition and the hints, little less of board work hereafter. Um, so the key co component of any algo algorithm that we'll discuss is its magnitude and direction, right? The gray has a lot of magnitude, whereas a uh, green has small magnitude. However, it's possible that when I start from the one of the pink curves, it might be a good idea if I'm, I'm here, like to go small if I'm green, if I'm in the green direction, have a small magnitude, right? So large is not always best. Whereas if I'm here, uh, you know, you see a large magnitude, in fact, has like to some oscillation. Right? So this is a bad, uh, the gray probably is a bad step choice. So, uh, <clears throat> Okay, so how fast the function changes is important. That's Lipschitz continuity, Lipschitz smoothness. What is the curvature of the function? Is an upper or lower bound is going to matter? If the function oscillates, can I, in fact, I had kind of hand waved the property of Lipschitz a smoothness of composition. But I'll just bring back that today. Remember I, I said that composition of two Lipschitz smooth functions, especially the case of Cross entropy, right? Is Lipschitz smooth? I hand waved it. I'll give a little bit more intuition when we uh, plunge into actual algorithms. Um, and if the function oscillates, then the updates might also lead to oscillating solutions. And finally, um, convexity is often handy. And we'll be using convexity generally to, and not only ensure global minimum, but also give some good <clears throat> convergence rates. So, uh, Idea behind gradient descent, right? Our most favorite algorithm is given a convex function f, find an x such that fx minus fx star is less than or equal to epsilon. So you want to be really close to your optimal solution. Um, and uh, we'll often like to visualize all this in terms of the so-called level curves. Right. <clears throat> um, so the idea behind gradient descent is is that you should move from one level curve to another tangential to the level curve at that point. Tangent. I mean, sorry, uh, orthogonal, orthogonal to the tangent at the level curve at that point. So this is the gradient of f. At x. <clears throat> okay, and uh, and we generally expect the x star to exist if for a convex function, the optimal point. So we expect that <clears throat> there is indeed some x star here, which we are seeking. So, which means the level curves also will be uh, giving convex sublevel sets. The idea is to go iteratively. So, xt plus one is xt minus gradient gamma times gradient of fxt. So, this is if th this is my current point xt. Then my next iterate is xt plus one. Okay, this gamma is basically the step size. 
<clears throat> and that needs to be often said. Okay, so yeah, just recapping all the points I made here. The gamma is the magnitude part, and uh, can risk a slightly larger value of gamma here. <coughs> But as I as I keep going inside, I can't risk, right? I need to be more careful. So the gamma values, so maybe I'm here, I can take a slightly larger plunge. But as I go inside the level, you can see that um, too large a step might lead to overshooting. It will be conservative. In fact, even uh, the gray point, even though you're outside, uh, you have to be careful, okay? <clears throat> Think. Yeah. Okay. Um, critical question is how much time does it does it take to reach an absolute and approximate solution? If I keep doing this, right? So I do while absolute value of f of x t plus one minus f of x star. I don't know what is f of x star, right? I want to go close enough to f of x star. What will I do? Sorry? x star plus epsilon. I, I, x star is my optimal point here, right? I don't know what is x star. So I, I'll iterate until? xt. F of xt plus 1 minus f of xt is less than or equal to epsilon dash. So it will not be the same epsilon, right? I want to get close enough to epsilon. Right? That's my goal. Goal. This is my goal. F of xt minus f of x star, x star should be less than or equal to epsilon. But I'll do this, which is f of xt plus one minus f of xt is less than equal to epsilon. Or I might try something else. What do you know is a sufficient condition, at least for a convex condition, convex function, sufficient condition for optimum. Yeah, or the norm of the gradient f. At xt plus one is less than equal to epsilon double dash, something like this, right? So we'll we'll see a little more on you know why certain conditions might be effective. Um, but yeah, empirically, this is what you would do. Sometimes you'll take a combination of these two functions. <laughs> Right. So, so now when, when you say how much time does it take, there are two aspects to it, right? It will be a function of epsilon. Okay, so this epsilon. How much time it will take will depend on what your f star is, right? Obviously, it cannot depend on this. Uh, depend on epsilon dash or epsilon double dash. Because those are my empirical hacks. Okay, so goal is this. Question is time. Is it of the order of one by epsilon, one by epsilon square, one by epsilon cube? In fact, we'll see something called log of one by epsilon. The time required. How, how many iterations? When I say time t, it could be this. Let's let's put a capital T here. Okay. So the question is, how much time will it take? Which of the three is more preferred? Log of one by epsilon? In the second most preferred will be? So epsilon is going to be a very small value, right? So one by epsilon square will be larger than one by epsilon. One by epsilon square will be larger, right? So this 
थ्री ग्रेटर देन वन ग्रेटर देन टू मोस्ट प्रेफर सेकेंड मोस्ट इज वन वेब सीरीज In fact, epsilon square, you'll see that it's you get that easily, and it's not very happy. You're not very happy. Okay, so X star will be the global minimizer, and uh, we're going to now characterize uh, the convergence using some properties of F. So let F be Lipschitz continuous. Let's begin with parameter beta for F. If F is smooth. Let the gradient be Lipschitz continuous with parameter L. That means F is Lipschitz smooth with parameter L. Okay, so just register these L continuity parameters beta and smoothness parameter. is n okay <clears throat> so in general the gradient f if it's lipschitz continuous that is if lipschitz smoothness we saw for bounded interval this is a more restrictive condition right the smoothness so again good to have um, some expectation This is kind of uh, Lipschitz smoothness is generally more preferred and rarer. Then Lipschitz continuity. I'm not saying L is greater than B. Okay, so don't take this to be L is not L and B have no connection directly. But the Lipschitz smoothness is more preferred than Lipschitz continuity. I will use L continuity in general. Since it's more generic, especially on bounded sets, you know, right? Pretty much every function, a large class of functions, will have um, Lipschitz smoothness, so Lipschitz continuity, but it will give weaker time guarantees. Okay, so yeah, this is how it will uh, generally progress: x one, x two, x three, and literally get closer as you proceed. Sorry. And uh, the other question, other concern is what should be the step sizes? Okay, how do you get the step size? I said, said I just said gamma, but gamma itself may become a function of t time steps time step t. Okay, so I'm going to add the suffix t here on gamma. right we need to be sensitive to where we are now there are you know conditions there are approaches to even determine the right value of gamma and as we will proceed with you know some of the accelerated methods gamma itself also comes as part of your curvature and so on okay okay so let's analyze for this case lipschitz continuity with parameter l that's what we we'll consider l remove the smoothness under this condition And I'll add convexity later on. How fast can we converge? Okay. So I'm 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 going to write not write much on the board. Pretty much everything in the slides. So from the de definition of gradient descent, I know this property, right? The dot product of the gradient at time step t with x t minus x star. Why do I start with x t minus x star? Just these are the pertinent questions you should write. Right? I'm uh, my analysis will always begin with. Where where I want to go, not with x t minus x t plus one. Okay, so analysis highlights. We are not going to write the analysis, but the first part, the highlight is we begin with the gradient dot product. G t is the gradient. Okay, so I'll just give given this a name. A gradient of f x t is g t. G t dot product. With x t minus x star, I look at this. Now I expand it. What is g t? What is x t minus x star? <clears throat> so 
so i know that gt is nothing but this gt this gt is nothing uh, nothing but xt plus 1 so xt minus xt plus 1 divided by gamma t i just put a gamma here okay so in some analysis we'll just so in the initial analysis we'll kind of just look at gamma and then we'll often show an existential convergence we say okay for some series of gamma it converges so that's our first concern that do there exist gammas for which phase converges and how fast and right? then we can also work backwards toward those gammas right setting everything up front is not necessary so we have kept it as gamma okay some gamma so this expression comes very clearly okay? no 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 rocket science here okay just annotating the same thing gt is nothing but one one upon gamma xt plus 1 minus xt sorry this is um yeah i i may i reverse the sign this is negative of the sign let me put a negative here Oh. Okay, negative. Now some algebra. So, okay, analysis inside step number one was this expanding. Step number two was is just algebra. and what is the algebra the algebra is that this expression looks like a dot product and can be written in terms of some difference of squares okay or some kind of <laughs> some and difference of squares in fact that's the case so 2v transpose w is v norm b square plus norm w square minus norm of v minus w square what have i done here v is g transpose Uh, so gt transpose and xt minus x star is w okay so i just gave these names gave them fancy names called this is algebra in terms of v and w right and i have expressed 2v transpose w as you know now we square Plus norm W square minus that's it, and then this is something we'll use quite often. Let this trick. Okay. Uh, so then. Yeah, that's a trick. Two v transpose w, is, uh, right? Now what happens? Let's look at the next step. So far, so good, right? So then I can rewrite this entire expression on the right hand side. This right hand side expression I'm rewriting x t minus x t plus one transpose x t minus x star. Okay, so I have uh, written it down here. Okay, so a little bit of hard work, <clears throat> but after the hard work, you'll find that some expressions are turning out to be again GT. Okay, so and then you get uh, yeah one upon gamma because of substitution substitution from the right hand side. Right hand side has okay, so <clears throat> gamma. So G by GT is what is. One upon gamma xt one is xt plus one, which is the same as v. On the right hand side, I explicitly write everything in terms of xt one is xt plus one. Okay, so yeah, to be more specific, I did not use this to be gt. My, my v transpose was set to it's my v transpose was set to xt one is xt plus one. And W was set to the other expression, x t minus x star. Right? 
that, that's how it was said. Okay. Um, so th thereafter, when I set it, I, I also kind of observe that XT minus XT plus one is basically GT, gamma times GT and so on. So gamma square times GT, but one upon gamma and gamma square will get cancelled out. Okay, so this I've now elaborated it colorfully. So again, I'm reminding you, how did I, what did I do? I set this to V, this set to W. And thereafter, I expanded, after expanding, um, um, now I'm going to do the following. After expanding, I'm going to do a telescopic summing. So this is a third important step. The third analysis highlight is moment you see some terms like this, xt minus x star, xt plus one minus x star, one with a positive sign, the other with a negative sign, you should be tempted to do telescopic summing. Okay. The third analysis highlight. Okay, and when you do telescopic summing, that's, you find that <clears throat> this xt minus x star and xt plus one minus x star, which have different signs, in subsequent expansions, they get cancelled out. One point to note is what should be your start and end index? Okay, where do you sum from and where do you end? So, especially note. Please pay attention. To start and end index. Of summation. <clears throat> so I have sum from t equals 1 to t minus 1. This is my rough work. We'll see the next slide whether that really works out. So. <clears throat> And as expected, all these will get cancelled out except for the first and the last one, right? When you begin, what will be the index? When you begin the summation from t equals 1, x1. x1 minus x star will remain. And when you end, what will remain? You summed it to t minus, t minus 1. Then what do you get? xt, right? And xt minus x star. The GTs will keep getting summed anyways. But now you're probably getting an idea why a norm on GT is interesting. What does Lipschitz continue to tell you? The rate of change of the function, which means some bound on the norm of a gradient. Right? <clears throat> So the story hopefully started coming together now. Um, okay, so I have summed over everything. So this expression I'll write down. Once in a while we'll write down expressions. Okay, so after all the cancellations, I have got, oh sorry, I have some t equals zero to t minus one, okay. Not one. I had said one on the, in my handwritten form, but it's zero. So t equals 0 to t minus 1, gt. I would like to start from 0 because I want to the first iterate, or the 0th iterate. Okay, this 1 upon 2 gamma is multiplying this whole thing x naught minus x star square minus xt minus x star square plus uh, there's a summation overall gt square. T equals zero to T minus one. 
ओके सो नाउ वी आस्क सम क्वेश्चन दिस लेफ्ट हैंड टर्म कैन इट बी अपर बाउंडेड बेस्ड ऑन कॉन्वेक्सिटी तो मोमेंट यू गेट डॉट प्रोडक्ट ऑफ ग्रेडियंट विथ सम डिफरेंस ऑफ एक्स नॉट एक्स स्टार राइट You think, oh, this dot product is basically like <clears throat> the hyperplane equation, and can it be upper bounded by the function? Natural question. The green part. The last part I already hinted. Can it be upper bounded based on Lipschitz continuity? Right. So, so we bring back our assumptions. Can Lipschitz continuity help here? And can convexity help you? Is this clear? Okay, so continuing, uh, so continuing the discussion. In what if you in what convexity? F f of x t minus f of x star is less than equal to g t transpose x t minus x star. Okay, g t g t transpose x t minus x star. Upper bounds f of x t minus x star. Transpose. Okay, so then question comes: What happens if you apply summation here on the left-hand side? You have lots of f of x, right? Can we at least assume that the f of x is decreasing at every step? I mean, is there a point in choosing a gamma? That doesn't even lead to decrease in f, right? So if I'm successfully summing up the f of x t's, they rather be shrinking, and the largest one will be f of x not, right? So, so can I kind of assume that this entire thing is <clears throat> um oh. In fact, if I want the other way, f of x t is always greater than or equal to f of x capital T, right? So I can also I can go the other way also. This is like t times f of x t minus f of x not, something like this. T times f of x t minus f cap x capital T final iterate minus f of x not if it's decreasing. So Now you can start thinking what are the next steps, right? So every step here should give you hints what could potentially happen. So let's let's kind of speculate. Okay, yeah, I just, I'm just saying how convexity, right? You remember all this, right? Convexity is because uh, f of x t minus f of x star x star basically we're going to be above the g t the dot product. Okay, so all I've done here is f of x star is greater than equal to f of x t plus g t transpose x x uh, x uh, star minus x t, and I've just take taken uh, this x uh, sorry g t transpose x t minus x star to the other side, and f of x minus f of x star the other side. Okay. Okay. Now, so I have got this. Now what I do is okay. Uh, um, on the right hand side, what I have is also interesting. F of x not minus x star. F of x t minus f of x star. F of x t minus f of x star obviously is greater than or equal to zero, right? So I've I've just said um, 
I could just drop this and make it greater than or equal to, right? So I'm just saying I'll drop this second term. Of x t minus x star, and simplify my right hand side. See, I want to get rid of um, x t as far as possible. I mean, I want to my function value should be close, right, to x star. So I have gotten rid of that part. <clears throat> so that leaves me with f of x naught minus x x star and the summation over g t. So this this entire thing has now simplified. The right hand side is simplified. Now I'm going to apply some of my other tricks. Okay, so let's continue. Right. So next, what we'll do is I, I will I'm complete the analysis based on the elements we have brought together so far, um, and uh, we're going to focus on uh, you know simplifying this a bit more. So now what we'll do is, um, as I said, we'll combine two with three. So two was basically the convex inequality. I have added it here, the convex, ine uh, convex inequality, right? And then the right-hand side is now simplified. So pretty much what I have written on the board is now coming up here. And now we are kind of set to use the uh, two more properties. One is Lipschitz continuity on the norm of GT square. And the other is the summation. What will I do with the summation? On the left-hand side, f of x t minus f of x star. I gave a hint there, right? What will I do? I'll only use the f of x capital T, the final trait. And x star, sorry, this is x star. Not x star, not x star. <clears throat> okay, I still have an x naught minus x star. Um, and I'll have a use some trick there. I'll basically assume that my first iterate is not too far from the optimal point. See, if my first iterate is very far from optimal point, then anyways, the algorithm is going to take time, right? You can't say I am going to start with South Africa and reach Antarctica, and that should take the same amount of time as you will reach, say, from Iceland to sorry, from uh, Australia to Antarctica. That's not fair. I mean, your first iterate is going to matter. If it's a stupid first iterate, you have to pay the price. So the this is interesting that you have x naught minus x star. This might stick around. We can't do much about it. But what we can do more about is the the other two terms. Okay? So we can't do much about this term, but uh, other than say, assuming that your first iterate is within some ball of radius B or something like that, these two terms we'll address right away. Okay. <clears throat> so we have all of these terms and the terms in red are on the right hand side and we'll further expand on them. So let X naught minus X star be less than equal to R. As I said, if I start from South Africa to go to Antarctica, I'll have to, uh, South Africa, bad idea, North America to go to Antarctica, right? So then like, I'll assume that my points are all within the radius R. And also assume that gradient of F is less than or equal to B for all X, which is my Lipschitz continuity property. So these two I'll bring in. So the right hand side, I'm now simplifying. So right hand side is going to be gamma by two times t b square, t is the number of iterates, plus r square by two gamma, where r has come because the first iterate should be within radius r square by two gamma, the right hand side. Now this this extreme right hand expression, right? Now the next trick. So far my gamma was all kind of left free, say some gamma which reduces iterates, some gamma, right? Now we are going to tighten the noose around gamma. Say, oh, obviously you are supposed to be a reasonable gamma. Well, who are, what is the reasonable gamma? Okay, so the fourth trick. Uh, um, the fourth trick is basically, see this RHS, 
this upper bound, right? With all my radius. Okay. So if you want a fourth trick, uh, is no, it may be actually x naught minus x star is less than or equal to r. I, I'll call that my fourth trick. Okay, my fifth trick. My fifth trick will be to say, well, the right hand side has a gamma. Left hand side doesn't have a gamma. Right? So if this inequality is going to hold, can I find the smallest value the right hand side can take with respect to gamma? Can I minimize the right hand side with respect to gamma? Can I get a series of steps that give me a small value of gamma of right hand side? Okay. So mini, the fifth trick is to minimize RHS. And now for us, the RHS has become very specific gamma by two T B square plus R square by two gamma. So minimize this RHS with respect to gamma. The scalar, and you can do that by setting its derivative to zero. And that happens for gamma equals R by B square root T. Okay, so some value. Now you'll see later on that there are some more recipes for getting good gammas. But at least we have shown that, you know, <clears throat> this holds for all gamma, might as well hold for this gamma. Okay. Okay, so I'm just highlighting all my points here. So first we have E1 on the left hand side, which was independent of gamma. E2 was a function of gamma. And we are saying, well, if E1, which is independent of gamma, is less than or equal to E2, which is a function of gamma, then I could minimize the right hand side with respect to gamma. E2 with respect to gamma, the inequality should still hold. Okay. So, and the other trick I already said is X naught is within radius of R from X star. Okay. All this is putting together my tricks four and five. <clears throat> now what next? Can, can you suggest what, what, builds, what else is left? Have you solved all the problems in the world? We have invoked Lipschitz continuity. <clears throat> so we may want to just put all of this cleanly together. Okay. The first thing. So I have put gamma equals R by B under square root T. And now I have got one upon T summation F of X T minus F of X star is less than or equal to R V by square root T. What's the next trick? What can I do with the left hand side? f of xt minus f of x star summation will be greater than or equal to f of x capital T minus f of x star. Or what have that done in the board is I said, okay, even if let's say there is not a, so sometimes unfortunately if you're doing stochastic grid, uh, no, sorry, if you're doing stochastic obviously, but if you're also doing subgradient descent, you'll see later on. Iterates may not always decrease at every iteration. And the function value may not always decrease with every iterate. So we can say, well, take the best iterate so far. Right? But we would ideally expect the f of xt, f x capital T to be the smallest value. So whatever iterate. <clears throat> so you're saying this part, the left hand side, find the f that is the smallest. Choose x hat to say argument over i f x i is a final trait. 
शो दैट दिस सेटिस्फाइज योर भाव बाउंड राइट सो वन अपॉन टी ऑल वी आर सेइंग इज द लेफ्ट हैंड साइड इज गुड इनफ द फंक्शन वैल्यू एट द बेस्ट इटरेट व्हिच इज एवरेज बाय टी समड ओवर ऑल द टीज इज लेस देन इक्वल टू आर बी बाय स्क्वायर रूट टी ओके Yeah, pretty much there. Yeah, so I've just depicted it here. Show that f of x. Right, this is uh, this part satisfies the above. So f of x. Uh, so you start with f of x naught, and you keep on decreasing. But your f of x star is here, red, and uh, x hat is basically the best you got so far. Um, it, um, the rest is pretty pretty much the same. So, I've just now used that f of x hat minus f of x star, one upon t upon t is equal to one upon t f of x hat minus f of x star summed over all values, which is less than equal to the right hand side. Yeah. This LHS, which one? Ha, this one. Yeah. So I'm saying the summation over all the iterates f of x t minus f of x star, where all the f of x t's are going to be greater than equal to f of x star. We are saying the the function that closest that came closest or the iterate that came closest to f of x star in function value is x hat. So that will be certainly less than equal to f of x t minus f of x star summed over all, and that's I want to upper bound that right. I want to upper bound the best function value, which ideally is the last iterate. Ideally, it is the x x capital T only. But I'm just saying I'm just keeping the statement more generic in case there was not a guaranteed descent at every step. See, I also chose my gamma such that it minimizes the right hand side, na. My gamma was such that it minimizes the right hand side. What if for that choice of gamma, I, there was the descent was not guaranteed at every step? You, I mean, some gammas could have overshot. If that gamma could have overshot sometimes, right? So I'm just saying, let's be safe and pick the best x hat. Okay, then that f of x hat minus f of x star is going to be certainly less than or equal to r v by square root t. Okay, so now I have come come to the main part. So I am going to. Sorry. Ah. Uh, uh, the right hand side can still be a big number, but it's varying as one upon square root t. That's the key here. Okay, so let's write down what have we got? F of x hat or x t minus f of x star. Is less than equal to R V by square root T. This is the key find so far for for all the hard work. Okay, this part. Now I want to know what does this mean in terms of time. We want f of x star minus f of x t minus f of x star, or f of x hat, call it whatever, right? Minus f of x star should be less than equal to epsilon. So, how much time is it required? Does it require one upon epsilon, one upon epsilon square, log of one upon epsilon? That was my original question, right? Now, can you tell me what this means? If you want, just call it f of x t, just to be safe, right? I mean, f of x t is the final iterator, okay? What is the connection between the pink part and the part highlighted here? Sorry, one by epsilon square. He is saying that if I want this value to be less than equal to epsilon, then the time required will be one by epsilon square, right? Here. Suppose our need is to find a t such that f of x hat minus f of x star is less than epsilon. <clears throat> so, what's the sufficient condition 
for that to be less than equal to one by epsilon, uh, less than e epsilon, <coughs> which will mean that R B. So this right hand side, if it's less than epsilon, if the right hand side is less than equal to epsilon, right? I, that's all. I'm saying make my right hand side less than equal to epsilon. What does this imply? R B by square root T is less than equal to epsilon. Which will mean T is greater than equal to T is greater than equal to R square T square by epsilon square, right? You got it? So t is greater than equal to r by r square b square by epsilon square. Here, you just flip the numerator and denominator and square both. That's all I need. So I have got the worst of all. Okay. Now what next? What can I do? Any thoughts? Okay, so <clears throat> you're saying we can improve. So why should gamma be fixed? Why can't gamma be a function of t? Right? Those are good questions. Okay, so I'll erase the right hand side. You got the tricks, all the four, all the five elements, right? Now you know if you get a new problem, what are the tricks you look for? Algebraic trick. Telescopic summing, right? Minimize with respect to gamma. Um, look at the best iterate. So all these tricks are clear here. Uh, and of, of course, Lipschitz continuity and convexity. Uh, maybe Lipschitz smoothness could be another trick we could change. What, what if I get Lipschitz smoothness? So all these questions you may be asking yourselves. Okay, so let's... Uh, so basically, the summary here is T should be greater than or equal to R square B square by epsilon or <clears throat> within a fixed time T, you will get less than or equal to epsilon. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, epsilon will be greater than or equal to R B by square root T. Okay. Now, question, one question I am leaving for you is what will you consider this to be? Order or omega? Have you done a course on algorithms? So what kind of convergence is this? Is an order or omega? Oh, sorry, big O. Order is big O or omega? Is it big O or omega? Huh? Sorry? Omega 1 upon epsilon square? So big omega is about limiting the lower bound. Here, the function for epsilon tending to infinity. Right? <clears throat> so this kind of analysis is less relevant. See, because you can think about it. Um, the big omega is generally about limiting the lower bound behavior of the function when epsilon is tending to infinity. So not completely relevant here. We will just use O here, order, right? More generally. <clears throat> Though you may be tempted to think of this as omega. People have asked this question in the past, so I just put this note here. But it's not something we'll spend too much time on. I mean, I think for us, what matters is that it is not fast enough, right? So I have also some optional slides on rate and order of convergence. Yeah, right? So you can look at those. I in, early on, I would spend some time, you know, there's an entire series of uh, slides I have on that. But suffice it to say that given a Lipschitz continuous function gradient descent with step size gamma equals rb by square root t achieves a solution x hat such that f of x hat minus f of x star is less than equal to epsilon rb r square b square by epsilon square iterations. So the final result. So as expected, we are going to critique it. The advantage is it goes to zero as t uh, gets large. We are happy about that. 
<clears throat> and it's independent of the dimensionality of x. X could be hundred dimensional, thousand dimensional. It still is not going to affect. And the disadvantage. The disadvantage is it's too slow. To achieve an error of zero point zero zero one, we need ten raised to four r square b square iterations. Right, and if you want zero point zero 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 one. 10 raised to 8 iteration. So every time I add one decimal point, I need squared number of iterations. And then also other disadvantages, the assumptions in the analysis of the algorithm does not assume that the step size gamma is obtained in a more principled manner. So again, I have some optional slides on oh, extra slides on RBO principle. I'll, I'll show you some uh, no, some plots. How RMU? We have actually very nice collab notebooks on setting up the RMU, right? Conditions, uh, the 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 step size search. Okay, so it doesn't use any of that sophistication. <clears throat> and the R is characterizing the initial iterate distance only. Can we get better than that? Um. Yeah, so, and the recipe with this assumption is that if you want to get close to the optimal, you'll need number of iterations inversely proportional to the square of how close you want to get to the op optimal. That's also a problem here, right? Number of iterations will be inversely proportional how square, you, how close you want to get to the optimal. So, sorry. so the first question is, can we do better than using Lipschitz smoothness? Okay, so we had knocked off Lipschitz smoothness. I'm going to ask this question. If I had, instead of Lipschitz continuity, if I had Lipschitz smoothness. What would change in the, that one reason I didn't erase any of this is, I just want to ask this question. What do you think will change? These steps won't change, right? Step number one, GT, XT minus X star expanded, nothing will change. Algebra, will it change? No, no implication. Telescopic summing? No, it won't change. <clears throat> but after telescopic summing, what did I do? I use? On the, uh, sorry, on the right hand side. Lipschitz continuity. Now, if I have to deal with norms of gradient, how can Lipschitz smoothness help? So Lipschitz smoothness will help if I'm looking at difference in the gradients. So I can't just blindly follow this path. Something has to change. Right? So I'll be stuck. I'll say, oh, now I don't know what to do. Right? So Lipschitz smoothness obviously is going to be helpful because it's going to say, well, you're, you're characterizing an upper bound on the smoothness, right? You're saying, well, function cannot curve so much. Uh, on the upper bound on the curvature. Function cannot curve so much. That's what you're saying. Can that reflect in your steps? Okay. <clears throat> so question is, can t greater than or equal to r square, b square, epsilon square, say become one upon epsilon or log of one by epsilon or something like that. So you can take the detour to understand the rate and order of convergence, etc. Uh, so that you can look at. There's a notion of Q linear, Q sublinear. I'm not going into that right now. So we want to do better, right? Uh, using this bound on smoothness. So bounded gradient is Lipschitz continuous, bound, smoothness is Lipschitz continuity of gradient. Uh, so Lipschitz smoothness parameter L, if F1, Fm are smooth convex functions, then the convex function summation lambda Fi is smooth with the summation of the, of the, of the scale summation of those smoothness parameters. Okay, so I'm just recapping what smoothness will be, right? Um, you can also show that the convex uh, function f of g x is smooth with parameter l norm a square when g x is a x plus b. Okay, so if you compose a, a 
use a linear transformation on the argument of a function then the norm of the matrix associated with the linear transformation will need to be multiplied with the smoothness parameter where uh, this this a is a, the norm is basically a spectral norm okay so you can think of how to derive a bound on the value of l so now we are getting into practicality so far we just talked about lipschitz smoothness but if i use logistic laws which i know is lipschitz smooth i want to know well how is this l how is this l going to look like right it shouldn't happen that for all the hard work i do the b lipschitz continuity parameter was much smaller than l right otherwise this hard work will be laid to waste you are saying okay a log of sorry one upon epsilon square but your multiplicative constants are so big right so it turns out that they are not that bad it's so it's it's good i mean lipschitz constant will turn out to be of similar order lipschitz smoothness constant and we are going to specifically use this inequality okay so like the strong convex inequality but now you have an upper bound in terms of y minus x norm square okay so we are pretty much set uh can you now suggest where you would make a change just look at the last inequality can that give you a lead on where you would make the change So yeah, the spectral norm I'm, as I forgot to define, but it's here it is. But as you think about it, a little bit more uh, on last week, last class, <clears throat> you I, I had kind of told you that uh, function the composition of Lipschitz smooth functions is also Lipschitz smooth, right? Let's just get the flavor of how logistic loss is, is Lipschitz smooth. Okay, so I've just written this down here. If you recall, logistic loss we had composed it as f1 of f2. F1 was log of one plus zero to t, right? And we show that it is Lipschitz smooth. F2 is minus of yi transpose theta trans yi theta transpose xi. Okay. The Hessian is upper bounded by an l equals zero. This Hessian, the green part. Okay, so now look at this. If you have a linear transformation a x plus b, like right, theta transpose, is like a linear transformation. Then you look at the spectral norm of a. What will be the spectral norm? What is spectral norm? Maximum singular value. I should I have written lambda, but it, what I mean is singular value. Maximum singular value. So you can show that the Hessian is indeed upper bounded by some l equals zero. So l is zero actually in this case. Okay, so you can show that this is actually Lipschitz smooth <coughs> by just that property. Okay, so this is a sketch of derivation, summation f one f two theta. If you apply this, then basically um, you can so you can basically find this to be lambda max of p i trans uh, so some some Cauchy Schwarz inequality, so theta transpose p i right. Y i theta transpose x i is the same as theta transpose p p i where theta is sorry p i is y i times x i. So you just write down this expression, and uh, for logistic regression, the l will be some gamma or eta eta into one by four. 
into the lambda max of pi pi transpose okay so you can derive the lipschitz constant lipschitz smoothness constant so now let's go back to our main job right we we know how to derive l <clears throat> where will i change so in fact what i'm doing here is i'm cha i'm changing the proof methodology itself because i'm not able to fit in directly i'm starting with uh, the lipschitz smoothness condition okay <clears throat> these i'm not saying these will not play a role they may, they will start playing a role somewhere telescopic something all of them have a role to play but the same trajectory can't hold okay so what i do here is i write down this first equation so i'll, I'll use these other properties sometime soon now i want to know where i can insert my indices <laughs> right uh, so let's say i i actually plot my indices here xt plus 1 this will be xt hmm? so i'll make my start making my slight modifications here i'll put an xt plus 1 and this will be xt okay we have done that further i realize that y minus or xt minus xt plus 1 minus xt is minus of gamma gt so i again make these substitutions the right hand side becomes uh, the right, extreme right becomes gamma square norm gt square times n square l by 2 okay so okay so now can i do something different here i have got a minus of gamma gt square norm gt square plus l by 2 gamma square gt norm gt square can i do something different here well a, a, a kind of trick i had explained earlier i'm going to bring it back out of order so my all this will remain my trick one now is what did i do with respect to gamma i minimized can i do the same thing here or rather there right <clears throat> after substituting gamma gt square now have gamma norm gt or gamma gt and norm gt square i can complete the squares and then what complete squares but what what can i do specifically i can minimize the right hand side with respect to what gamma so our first guinea pig is gamma right so first thing we'll do is gamma okay, so one is minimize rhs to gamma with respect to gamma see why am i able to do that because this holds for all values 
should hold also for that gamma which minimizes the right hand side. I'm still sticking to a fixed value of gamma. Okay. So, so these are the considerations. Which trick to apply next? Trick one, algebraic expand in terms of squares. Trick two, telescopic summing. All the tricks I had mentioned here. Trick three, minimize upper bound with respect to parameters that do not characterize the LHS. That's that's the trick I've applied. LHS doesn't have gamma, RHS has gamma. Now let's set the derivative with respect to RHS of two of gamma to zero. Gamma is one upon L. Wow, that's interesting. The step size being recommended here is one, one upon the Lipschitz smoothness function. There's a reason I spent a little bit more time on the Lipschitz smoothness factor, which is L has some interesting property there. <clears throat> okay, so. To get L, gamma is one upon L. Okay, so now what happens? <clears throat> This gamma is one upon L, this is one upon L. My expressions will significantly simplify. So the value of gamma will hold also in the worst case. So minimizing upper bounds and maximizing lower bounds are frequently used tricks, okay? Here we minimize an upper bound. Obviously you need to ensure that the upper bound was a convex function. So all that I'm assuming you're done, it's a scalar. Function uh, scalar valued function in terms of gamma. Okay, so this what for what value of gamma is it minimized? Answer turns out to be one upon L. Gamma is one upon L. So now the result is very interesting. Very <laughs> we seem to have jumped very fast. Okay, to get f of x t plus one is less than or equal to f of xt minus 1 by 2l gt square. So I'm going to erase this part. Okay, it's a big leap now. So we are saying that See, you see what is happening. You're saying that, well, with this x of xt plus 1 is sufficiently smaller than f of xt. This is like a sufficient decrease. In fact, this is a motivation behind some of the RMO conditions. This, this is a sufficient you can see RMO conditions. Um, I've given, I'll be giving them as optional reading, but they basically say that, you know, make sure that you have to decrease sufficiently in each iteration. Hopefully if I get time, I may bring it up during the middle of your presentations, right? But uh, I don't want the speed to be derailed. So my point is even without convexity, uh, the assumption, the L smoothness gives some guaranteed decrease in every iteration, which is very interesting. If you set gamma to be one upon L. Okay. Now what next? What's your what's your next hunch? Hmm? So apply, apply what? Telescopic summing, yeah. Telescopic summing so soon. <clears throat> so you're you're saying apply telescopic summing because you have GT plus one and XT plus one and XT, right? So we are already kind of assured uh, the gradient descent is guaranteed to decrease the function value in every iteration. That is good news. And uh, now, uh, okay, but as a small recap, uh, in the case of Lipschitz continuity, we had said gamma to R B R upon B underscore R, sorry, R upon B square root T. So gamma was kind of a function of T. Here is a gamma is a constant one upon N. Okay, so that is another interesting difference I wanted to highlight. Okay, so just let me highlight this.
Okay, so now we are set to do the next. Yeah, so this gives you the tightest upper bound. Okay, so as some of you are suggesting, you probably want to do a telescopic summing here, right? So let's say we do this telescopic summing, sum over t equals zero to Yeah, sorry, the call. Um, if you do a telescopic summing, t equals zero to capital T minus one, similar kind of summation as earlier, then what do you get? <clears throat> so the left hand sides will cancel with the f of xt, f of xt plus one, left and right will get keep getting cancelled out. Okay, so that's the next step. Um, and what will I get? I'll still get a submission over the norm GT squares. Okay, so that we still have to deal with. The summation over norm GT squares are less than or equal to f of x naught minus f of x t. What will you do next? Sorry? Ah, lift its smoothness as well. <laughs> okay. What will convexity do? If you keep doing only Lipschitz smoothness, which is a continuity, convexity will be out of business, right? Just citing now this important step. <clears throat> so can we use some convexity assumption now is the question. <clears throat> so this is how we got, right? We have already got sufficient decrees. <clears throat> um, so we have, because we have sufficient decrees, I'm not taking the exact, I'm just making a note here. Earlier I was taking an exact, right? <clears throat> I didn't know if the lambda or the gamma would have decreased. Here I know there's decrease in every step. So I'm confidently taking X naught and XT. That's good enough for me. How can we apply convexity assumption? How will you apply convexity assumption? Can we do anything here? The right hand side. You remember how we got what we got here? We didn't, initially we didn't apply, so can we have convergence of the two? So I'll just change the numbers. That is one, two, maybe call it three, four. But this also gave you norm GT square, right? Can this be merged with that? You understand? So, this is not it. This. Okay. So let's just invoke. Invoking convexity recall uh, analysis one and two from gradient descent for Lipschitz continuity and convex functions. All that we had done here earlier, I'm just going to re invoke. Right? What was that? <clears throat> We first use convexity, then use Lipschitz continuity, but that we will not use. We want, and by the way, we want X star to start appearing. One thing you should become uncomfortable by now is there's only X naught, X T, but what about X star? I want to converge to X naught, uh, X star, sorry. Okay, so that will come from here. Let's do that. Okay, so the same thing. Now the same thing which I have applied here, I have, I have applied it again. Okay, no difference. Summing or telescope uh, again, telescopic summing here. Okay, so what I've done is one, two, and uh, three. 
the telescopic summing. So, uh, sorry, I'll call this. Uh, there were steps one and two there. Now it's become different. Three, four, five. Telescopic sum. You remember this? The expression we had just done for the previous analysis. So what will happen here, you know, x naught, x star, all, only those stay, right? Everything else cancel. So you have x star here. And here I have norm of gt square. The one I get from Lipschitz smoothness, I get that norm of gt square, summation, in fact. Okay. And I'll, I can apply the same L gamma equals 1 by L. The other thing is, I also dropped this part, right? x t minus x star was greater than or equal to 0. So I'll just put an inequality here, less than or equal to, and then that will persist. Okay, so all that is same. Nothing has changed. Okay, so here, here is my final expression. f of x t minus f of x star, summation. Now this, you remember this left-hand side, what did I do? f of x t minus f of x star, summation. This entire thing is greater than or equal to x hat, but I don't need an x hat. My x t, cap, x capital T, right? The right hand side will stay as it is. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so it can be shown that gamma is 1 over 1 L is good enough here as well to maintain the upper bound since we have found the gamma yielding lowest value. See, earlier we had said the less than or equal to 4 holds for all gamma. It also holds for gamma equals 1 by L. So nothing changes. So I'll substitute gamma equals 1 by L and use the same inequality. Okay, so now we are set. Um, okay. This is my final expression. Okay. Yeah, I also kind of say, say that f of x naught minus of xt is less than or equal to f of xt minus of x star. Sorry, the 6, 6 is this one. No? 6, this expression. Which I have got there, right? This expression we will now use. Okay, so I'm just going to write this last. Okay, so we use this is six. What I refer to is a six. This equation six that I use in conjunction with the previous inequality, which is summation t equals zero to capital T minus one f of x t minus f of x star less than or equal to 1 upon 2L a norm of gt, sorry, summation t equals 0 to t minus 1 norm of gt square plus L by 2 x naught minus x star norm squared. So I'm just saying that this f of x naught minus f of x t is greater than or equal to norm of gt square, right? I just substitute this entire thing. This is greater than or equal to. So I'll put a one more greater than or equal to than this. This is how I combine the two. <clears throat> is this clear? Now what happens? Um, are we done? We are nearly done. Okay, nearly done. So basically take the yellow, uh, yeah, uh, we'll take the yellow term to the LHS. This part we'll take to the left hand side. Okay. And uh, yeah, the rest is just explaining what happened. So how do you go from here to the convergence is the question. Okay, so I'm just swapping, take, take the terms in yellow, which I had marked earlier, into the left-hand side. So if you rewrite the math, you'll get this. f of xt minus f of x star, summation from t equals 1 to t is less than or equal to L by 2 x naught minus x star square. And we know that the function decreases in every iteration. 
So I know that f of x t is less than equal to f of x cap small t for t equals one to t minus one. So I will just use the f of x small t instead of capital T, right? And the whole thing divided, uh, whole thing multiplied by t. Okay, so that's it. So this is the key. F of x capital T minus x star is less than equal to L by two t x naught minus x star square. Okay, this is what we have derived. Now, does this look better than earlier? What I've got is f of x t minus f of x star is less than equal to L by two t norm of x naught minus x star square. Does this look better than earlier? What was it earlier? L upon square root t, right? We had a square root t. This is t, which looks better, right? Okay, so we'll again assume that x x not minus x star is within radius r. X not is within radius r from x star, <clears throat> right? And then if we put all these together. Uh, for f of x t minus x star less than equal to epsilon, it is sufficient that l r square by two t is less than equal to epsilon. So this implies that t should be greater than equal to r r square l by two epsilon. So instead of epsilon square, we have epsilon. So this is a final result. Given a smooth Lipschitz cause Lipschitz smooth convex function gradient descent with step size L, gamma equals one by L. You get less than equal to epsilon in R square L by epsilon iterations, which means for an error of zero point zero zero one, we need fifty R square L instead of ten thousand R square L. You see the difference, right? So what we'll do in the next class is okay. What if you add smoothness as well? So so far we had. So what what if we add strong convexity as well? Can strong convexity get me to log of one by epsilon? Okay. So uh, I'll give you again the lecture notes for re quick reading, but I, we, the the intuitions are going to be like this. Right? So I, I don't think it's worth writing everything on the board. The slides have it. Okay. Thanks.